Welcome back to the Mad Marketing Mums podcast. Today we are joined by special guest Holly Cardamone from Blue 51 Communications to talk all about content pillars and what constitutes a content pillar. Spoiler alert, they are not educate, entertain and inspire. Now this topic continues on from episode one as part of our content marketing foundation series. Back in episode one, we spoke about the first essential step for creating any content. And that is of course, to understand your audience. And if you haven't listened to that episode, be sure to go back, take a listen and to download our free worksheet to create your own ideal customer or client avatar. So once you understand who it is that you're trying to talk to. The next step, of course, is to work out, well, what it is that you're going to talk about. Now, this is something that we touched on on episode eight, Just Do It, where we spoke about overcoming posting paralysis and having a really clear idea of who it is that you're talking to and what you're going to talk about is, of course, going to make it a whole lot easier to create that content. But without further ado, let's have a little chat with Holly. Now, Holly is a writer and communication specialist. She's also the author of Tell Your Story, which I think really sums up what Holly is all about, as she helps people to tell their story and grow their brand through beautiful and compelling content and communications. She's a mum to two teenage cherubs, a word nerd, a bookworm, and a sucker for her Aussie Shepherd. And she always, always, always has a coffee within reach. You sound like my kind of gal, Holly. Welcome to the Mad Marketing Mums podcast. Welcome. What a beautiful welcome. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Holly. How did you get into branding and communications and why is, I guess, content and specifically what we're going to be talking about, content pillars, like your your shtick, your sphere of genius. I love hearing my name in your accent. I have to throw that in. I I, I sound a little funny. (laughs) You know, Italian girl, half of my family went to New York, to the Bronx, the other half came to here, to Australia. So whenever I hear my name in that accent, it takes me straight back to those streets of New York, which is so irrelevant to what you just asked me. (laughs) Isn't it? So storytelling is my thing. Like I've always been a sucker for a story and, in terms of communications, for me, I suppose it was about about bringing together these concepts, like how communications are so critically important to any brand, but particularly when it's when you're the face of the brand or you know you're running a business delivering services that you love, doing work that you love, and you're amazing at what you do, but marketing might not be your thing. Storytelling is such a beautiful way to bring that together because we all have stories about what we do. We might be lost in the detail or the day to day and of running a business and then throw in some cherubs and (laughs) all bets are off. But there, you know, that's, that's where I come from the storytelling component. Okay. So, so you do have this edited, don't you? Yeah, we'll edit. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry. YouTube might be uncut, but the the podcast itself will be edited. (laughs) Sorry, Krisha. Did you want to take the first, the first actual Uh, question? Yes. (laughs) Sorry, I thought I was. My apologies. Here we go. This is the stuff that we edit out. It's all right. It's all right. right. Let me just do this really quickly. It's hot, isn't it, today? I know. And we can't put on the air con. (laughs) All right. That's cool. We're all good. We're off to a great start. Let me think how I'm going to phrase this. Kalim, did you already have a nice way of Maybe you should take it. Okay. All right, I'll take it. I'm I'm lost for words. (laughs) All right. So, Holly, some of our, our listeners, yeah, you know, they are business owners and such, but obviously they don't necessarily have a an extensive marketing background. Can you explain for them what content pillars are and what they aren't? Okay, amazing question. So content pillars, the simplest way I use to describe it is the the themes by which you want to become known. So If you are a fitness professional working with mums of small kids, the messages that you will put out to your audience will be completely different to those messages that you would put out if you're working with blokes in their 30s who wanting to do, you know, those bodybuilding competitions. What will resonate with those big burly blokes will not resonate with the mum who just wants them to regain her energy after having babies. So 
that's a really clear way I think to describe it. So it's thinking about what you desperately want to be known for, what your where your expertise lies, of course, and where your experience is, but also equally what you don't want to be known for or not be limited by what you what you're known for. So I had a client a while ago who was all about action, but that's all that that person spoke to, like do this, just do this, and it was all very hustle focused. But her audience were people who were already a little bit frazzled. They didn't need more, just do this, just do this. They needed to know that she was, there was some credibility behind what she was saying. So what's the science behind this strategy to achieve more in your day? So it's about sharing your smarts, if it's appropriate, a bit of sass. So, and that's where content pillars can be really, really powerful because they're, they're a structure, they're a guide to stop you going rogue, but also stop you from pigeonholing yourself. Mm, I like that. And I say to my students and clients that really, It's that intersection when you're thinking about, okay, what can a content pillar be for me? It's really about, okay, it's that cross section between what you want to be known for, like you said, and what your audience kind of needs. And then, of course, we're all business owners here. So what those business goals are and trying to find the themes that can help achieve all of those things and help with all of those different areas so yes I like that now what would you say because I know there's a lot of confusion out there about what content pillars are and as I said before they're not educate entertain inspire sorry guys (laughs) sorry if, if you've got those written down as your pillars there's you know those are different content types that we can certainly be drawing on but pillars are I think a whole lot broader so and what kind of things I think you know if we're thinking about our content pillars and what we want to have for our business, what should we be steering away from when we're kind of thinking that? What aren't they? Look, there are definitely brand builders and there's brand damages. And when we talk, you know, I hear about the educate, inspire, what's the third one? Connect. Entertain. <laughs> entertain. Entertain. Or entertain. For me, they're goals. And I think they're really, really important. I think they have a place in a busy person's business because it ta- it does take a lot of thinking out. But what are you educating them about? So this is where your pillars might fall into that. So so if you're a busy working mum, for example, your con- one of your content pillars has to be about Sorry, if you're a business that works with busy working mums to free up more time and space in their lives to do the things that they love and, you know, whatever you do, whatever that business is, one of your pillars is always going to be about time hacks for busy working mums. And obviously that's a massive cliche and the um, the detail comes when you dig a little bit deeper. But what pillars are not goes very much back to what your brand is and what you want to be known for and how you share that through your pillars again it's quite nuanced like I one of my pillars a number of years ago was about my pillars for example so I have a communications consult consultancy and I help people with their communications and I help them with their writing be it their content strategy or writing books so one of my pillars is always 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 going to be about my communications toolkit so theory behind communication have you here's some stats about how to build a communications plan here's what's working now here's what's not the quick and dirty comms plan like that sort of comms content writing for business pillar that'll be the more you know here's how to write a cta call to action here's some easy ways to sexy up your content <laughs> if again sexy is part of your brand and of course it's part of mine I'm like you know <laughs> And then one of my pillars I added a few years ago because I was getting a bit bored with all the comms was who was this person behind this business? You know, for many, many of us, it's all about, you know, the no like trust and people need to know you and a really good way to do that is through the stories you tell. So I added a pillar which was all about Holly loves and it felt very, very self-indulgent at the time, you know, especially when you are in comms, you're very much used to putting the spotlight on someone else. And most people in business are the same. They want to, you know, do the work that they love. They want to be practitioners, not necessarily, you know, the me, me, me show. But in that, yes, I may make mention to the fact that I'm a working mum, but I have my boundaries within that. So being very, very careful and diplomatic here, ladies, with, with the content that I would share, I see content out there where people are using their children and what they might be going through as content pillars Mm. and it makes me really, really distinctly uncomfortable and it's a boundary I'd never, ever cross, never in a million years and I sound like a judgmental churlish shrew here. But, yeah, so I think when it comes to deciding what your pillars are, deciding what they're not is very important and then, again, like you said, it's, it's aligned to your business goals. So if you want to be seen as 
insightful, trustworthy, um, loyal, you know, all these amazing words, don't be putting content out there that's that's a contradiction of that. Mm, yeah. And I could I go on a tangent, I think, about not putting my kid on, on my my page, but I'm going to refrain from that because then I think we, we need to be here for a while. Because <laughs> it is a really big issue about keeping your children safe about consent on their behalf mm. and what's going to be out there forever. So, yes, a great tangent, but yeah, I think we need a whole episode. <laughs> because, yeah, there is a lot to unpack with that. But again, it comes back to it doesn't make sense for you to be sharing your kids and talking all about that because that's not what you want to be known for. You want to be known as the communication specialist, as the writer, as the author. So I think if, you know, as a bit of a rule of thumb, if people are thinking about their content pillars, it always comes back to that. What do you want to be known for? And of course, what do your audience want to hear about, right? (laughs) Like it's, are they interested in that content? I mean, they might be just from a purely nosy point of view, but not from deciding to work with you, right? So, And and there's an art to vulnerability, which I think has just been bludgeoned really badly. And look, I include in my content strategy little snippets and splashes because... (laughs) Here's my own self-indulgence. They're endearing. They help people connect. This is how I, as a working mum, run my business. And I'm someone who, as a teenager, there was a feature in either Clio or Cosmo, one of those teenage magazines that aren't around anymore, but it was like, what's in my handbag? And it was like, oh, my God, show me what's in your handbag. I've always loved that little peek under the hood. And so sharing as much as you're comfortable with it with in the context of your business. So If your business, for example, you're, again, personal trainer all about vegan, clean eating, don't be saying, here's me eating a Mars bar. (laughs) bar. (laughs) Yeah, so it's just about being consistent and or if you do something like that, talk about it in the context of your clients and, look, you know, you're going to have a hiccup on your road to clean eating. I do. We're all human and here's how I get over it step by step. You know, that's sort of helpful content if that's part of your brand. Yeah, love that. Love Mm. that. Yeah, just taking those things and, again, just always putting them through that lens of your brand and how you want to portray yourself to the world because we are doing this for business purposes. What you do on your own accounts, if you want to be an influencer, you know, for your personal accounts, that's fine. That's completely different. But here, of course, we're remembering that we are talking about building a business online and having some shred of credibility (laughs) and dignity, right? Fingers crossed. Yeah. And look, part of that, your content can serve so many broader business goals. And that example about how much do you share from your life as a working mum is a really good example of that. And if you've decided to set some boundaries around how you want to work this year, you know, the cherubs are back at school. These are my working hours. Content can be a really lovely way to show that. This is these are the rules of engagement for working with me and these are the rules that I, you know, what I expect of me, I'd expect of you. A bit nicer than what you stick in the bottom of your email. Or, you know, and it's it's a nice way to set expectations and it also invites other people to do the same. So, you know, the anti hustle sort of sentiment. I'm giving, I'm telling you, these are the hours that I work, these are my rules around how I run my business as a working mum. What are yours? So it's a conversation too. So that can be really inspiring, which is such a pretentious term, but it it can work those sorts of, content can work for you against those sorts of business goals. Yeah, Mm. and it's a point of relatability as well because then other mums will be drawn to you because they'll recognise that in themselves or they'll be inspired by what you're doing in terms of setting boundaries and maybe think, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I should I should do more of that rather than trying to put out a social media post while you're cooking dinner with one hand, you know. I'm sure we've all been there for sure. And even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking about your audience and what they're all the millions of balls they've got up in the air and what they might be might be facing behind the little squares. And I think it's also really important in terms of trust and credibility, as you talked about before, there's accounts that I see that in the one post, they're encouraging you to sign up for their $50,000 yearly program. The next post is, oh, it's time to share that I've just been a hot mess this week. And it's like, why would I invest that sort of money when you're telling me openly that you're a hot mess? And like I said about the vulnerability is 
I don't think that's a good pillar mm. <laughs> to have. And I know people use it as pillars. And that when you asked before, Clem, about what's not a pillar, be very, very aware of the message that you're putting out there hangs around. And if you're building trust, don't be talking about someone who is your, you know, your best friend in business. And then two weeks later, be talking about how you've been bullied by that person. It's just too messy and, mm. you know, and it's not a good look. It might perform really well, and it will. I have no doubt it will perform really, really well, but long term, it's brand damaging. I think that kind of leads into the next question. You've kind of you've kind of already answered this, but I think from a I guess from a parent's say a mental business owning parent point of view or even a time point of view, why bother with with content pillars? And what, what, what's the point? Why, why do we need them? And I, I find this to be rampant on TikTok as well. And we have had tangents and rants about this where people are like, just do this, just post a billion times a day and you're going to grow and explode and such, which is like, no, that's not the case. You don't have the structure, but why bother with this structure that we're talking about? Did she just say that to my face? Oh my God. <laughs> so I, I, I come here with these tough <laughs> questions, you know, like. <laughs> How very dare you? So look, content marketing, when done well, it is a slow burn, but far out, it's a powerful one. And look, you can do anything and you will get growth, but growth for what purpose? If you, you know, everything that I do in my business, everything that I know you do in your business, Krishla, is tied to a broader goal and, and, and it's embedded and it's cemented and it makes sense and it's strategic. I, you know, strategy is really, really important. So the problem with going scattergun or going rogue is the people who you want to work with don't actually know what you do. Hmm. They don't know what you do. And if they have an idea, it's the wrong one or, or you know, misconception about what it is you do, what the expertise you hold is and therefore you're either overlooked or you're disregarded or you're not even thought of so that's the danger with not having a strategy and not having content pillars attached to that Mm. strategy I think also from a practical point of view as well it helps keep you organized and there's times when you're like crap what am I going to do what am I going to put out you've already got you've got those foundations there with your pillars and you might also have a list of ideas that you've jotted down when you've had a spare minute that fit within them and you're like well okay and that's, yeah, and that's the heart and soul of my business because so many people are so close to what they do. They're incredible practitioners at whatever it is that they do, the services they deliver. They don't see the gold in it, and it is. It's hard to see your own, where the story is if you're not looking for it. And so that's, you know, that's the heart and soul of much of my business is help people come up with these ideas to tell their story. And we've all, it's hard to talk about yourself. And that's where if you can step out of yourself and think about the story or the expertise, and, you know, I'm a sucker for the post-its and brain session, brainstorming, brain dumping, sort them into categories. There's your pillars. Boom. And also, you know, when you scribble something down on anything, if it's not sitting right with you, it doesn't belong in your strategy or it might need tweaking or reframing. But it's I'm a fan of the scribble for truth telling. Oh, I like that. Mm. Yeah. And I guess the thing is. If you're going through that process, whether it be post-it notes, whether it be an Asana board, whatever you like to do, scribbling Mm. on a whiteboard, but seeing all of your content mapped out as one big story that you're telling. So all of these pillars, yeah, on their own, they might not tell the complete story, but it's almost like an Instagram feed. If you go to somebody's Instagram feed and look at their last nine or 12 posts on their grid, I would hope, I would recommend that those together tell that overall story of what you do, who you are, who you help, how you do that. That's it. And look, with the the whole mapping out thing, there is research that shows um, massive differences in the quality of output for brainstorming by hand compared to by keyboard. There's a really brain and the pen. Sorry, I'm getting all nerdy on you now. But the thing is- No, I love it. (laughs) <laughs> when you do have it mapped out, you can have that balance. So like that client I was mentioning before, um, actions and results were very important or are very important to her. So we gave her a pillar about that. Just do this. You can have that, but you're only having it once a month, not every freaking week. <laughs> not every single post is going to be about actions. So when you see it like that, you can see where the balance is. You can see if you're talking too much here, but you really want to be over here. And that links again back to your goals for your brand and for your business. 
Yeah. And it makes it interesting for your audience, oh, gosh. right? Mm. Yes, you're right. You're the idiot having to write this stuff. <laughs> Actually, get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. But it's true. Well, it makes it interesting for you as the content yes. creator and it makes yes. it interesting for your audience as the people consuming your content to have that variety. Yes. Yes, it's all within these similar kind of interconnecting themes, but it's not just every single post is a sales post. And I see this oh a lot God. with product-based yeah. businesses. Yeah. Here's my product, buy it. Here's my product, buy it. Here's my product. It's so boring. You know, and unless your product already has that story and that brand mm-hmm. reputation that I think I'm sure there's a lot of people who see the big, you know, fashion houses, for example, or whatever, they've got that whole backstory. Everybody knows, likes, and trusts them, unless they're Balenciaga. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's already established. But for us mere mortals just starting our business, we've got to build that whole big backstory before we can just show up and share a product and people will immediately jump on it. And by yeah. product, I say that in inverted commas because product, service, digital product, whatever that is. And look, and that comes back to a real, another really important point that content pillars will alleviate is how many times have you looked at someone's feed, their content, and you can't actually work out what it is they do yes. <laughs> or how you can buy from them. It's all about their story. And it sounds a bit counterintuitive for someone whose tagline is all about tell your story. It's some, It's Sometimes it's just far too much. I don't really care any more about your history. I've heard. I know what's happened here. How can I actually throw some money at you? And I think that's something that gets lost a bit in the whole tell your story. You know, you need to know me. This is who I am. Like, what's in it for me? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what people forget in the end is say with with digital, online, social, whichever, yeah. I guess, sub-medium of the internet that you use, this marketing, what you're doing to market your your service or your business is really, in the end, it's networking. Like as if you're going to a face-to-face event, you just don't see that face that's in front of you. And so how do you go, hey, this is me and this is how you can get to know me and this is what I do without actually talking to anybody? That's that's really what it comes down to, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. It's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. It's all about balance, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's really the balance, the talking about yourself, but framing it in a way that works for your customer Mm. and then saying, hey, I've got this thing that will help you in these ways because I know who you are and I know what you need and putting that all together, which sounds a little bit complicated, but it is really just something that I think with practice and putting content out there and reviewing what's working, you you will start to get the hang of, right? But you need some somewhere to start. Yeah. And that somewhere, of course, is these pillars. So I feel like we're pretty clear that, yes, we need them. How do we get started? What Give us a practical first step. The Holly. first step, I think, is, like I said, that massive brainstorming session. And who am I? What do I do? Who do, who do I do it for? And what do I want to be known for? Where does my expertise lies? An easy way to do that, and people sometimes freak out when I say this, is the whole case study concept. And I'm not talking university case studies with citations and all that sort of stuff. Picture your dream client. It's often someone you've already worked with. Stick their name in the middle of a piece of paper and go around mind mapping it. So why did they reach out to you? And what was their problems? What sort of words did they use when they came to you? How did they define their problem? Now, how do you define their problem? So you're the one with the expertise. They're saying their problem is X, Y, and Z, but you can really see that it's blah, blah, blah. So, and to me, that says, what are the questions that they should be asking, but they don't know how to? scribble 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 are all around that so what did you do with this person what was the process through that you took them through and now what's their outcomes and how what's their current state now and when you think about a specific person and it's someone you like it makes it really really easy to start writing against that person and look depending on what you're writing and your brand voice again if I'm writing a piece I'll think oh my gosh Crystal will really love this piece and I just imagine her reading it and I'll stick in some funnies for her because that's aligned to my brand and it's also aligned to her as my audience member so as a member of my audience someone who's reading my stuff and that can make it really, really feel really personal. It's like the whole pen pal thing from when we're a lot older than you, Shoe, but <laughs> like it's all I remember pen pals. <laughs> you know, are you there, God? It's me, Holly. So it's that sort of like writing directly to someone and and that can make that can bring some of the barriers down. 
And in terms of practicalities of actually writing things, what to write about, blank book, the uglier the better, and scribble before you actually commit to keyboard. And half of it you might not be able to use, but there'll be chunks of gold in there. As you get going, you'll you relax and you loosen yourself into it. And then go through with the highlighter, grab the key points, put a structure around it. I'm all about the structure. I mean, long form, but also captions as well. And look, you ladies have said it in one of your episodes, just do it. You know what I want to say in between those two words? <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Yes. It's not like buying, you're not spending $60,000 on a billboard on Dandenong Road here in Melbourne. Don't like it. If you can pull it off, <laughs> like none of it's permanent. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the thing. I think we overthink this. We get scared to put something out there in case it doesn't perform who cares if it doesn't yeah. perform on the platform? That's what if it. one person sees that and they contact you and they become a client? That was worth it then, even yeah. if it only reached 10 people. Who cares? That's, yeah. It's all about what happens off of the platform. So I love that mind mapping. I mean, I love me a good mind map. They are so fun to do. And, of course, what Holly's saying here in terms of writing out, this applies then for things like video scripts and stuff like that as well. So don't just think, you know, written captions or blog posts or whatever. It's, or it applies to all of your content. Absolutely. Love yeah. it. So we... We absolutely love mind maps and you're saying scribble and do a brain dump and such, but I can also see that say from some business owners as well, especially if this is their first time, it can be a little overwhelming. So I think from one problem that we do sometimes see with business owners that come to us is they get into this analysis paralysis when mm -hmm. it comes to creating their content and yeah. even just the sheer of just brainstorming the content. It's as if they've got blinders on and they've just, it's there. And they just cannot, I guess, produce the idea. You know, sometimes where you just get those those mind lapses and they they just get stuck into this hole. Where you can almost easily do that with your content pillars, like have a billion of them or not have enough, or you keep breaking your pillars down, going, is it educating? Is it fitting my brand? Does it fit my values? All that stuff. So what I guess is the bare minimum when it comes to content pillar creation that someone should have at least like absolute bare minimum for them to to create their their content marketing pillar and strategy look honestly from the work that i do with clients i the absolute maximum is four any more than that it's messy for you and it's messy for your audience the minimum is probably two or three and it depends on the business very much but for me for my clients i always have a pillar in there that's basically the meet krishla meet clem who are we what do we do who do we do it for what makes us tick and then the other two or three are your expertise what you where you're, you're and the message you want to be sharing. So for me, it's communications and it's writing or writing for a brand. Um, so I suppose probably two or, two or three absolute minimum. And even that, it's making me feel a bit twitchy, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's making my skin crawl. <laughs> I have five, but I have you? three that are weighted more heavily than the other two. Okay, yep, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so most of my content falls into those three and then there's another couple that I'll pull in as and when they're needed or if yeah. there's something topical yeah. or you know new that sort of come in that makes sense for me to talk about that but they're not they're not sort of my core yeah topics yeah. of conversation yeah, yeah. I've, I've always ended up with four somehow with every client and even working back in my corporate days it's it's always ended up four I don't okay. know why it's just four and look, four is a nice number because there's roughly four weeks in a month. So it's mm. a nice mathematical, in terms of analysis, when people are thinking what the living bejesus am I going to be talking about, which pillar does it fit into, four is nice and manageable. And the other thing that analysis, a paralysis by analysis and comparison itis, it's, it is really, really tricky. It's a funny sort of, you can see, you, you put your heart and soul into something and in terms of making writing easier and even coming up with ideas, the more passionate you are with, about something, the, the more it'll flow. We all know that. You know, when you sit down to write something that you know you have to do because it's in your pillar, it's important to your business, it's, you know, it's like a colonoscopy getting it out. It's <laughs> really exciting. You can't wait to write about this. Like, boom, it just flows. You look up and you've written like 50,000 words. So the more passionate you can have, passion you can have for something, the better. 
In terms of getting these ideas out and feeling like you can get them out, lots of mums in business groups everywhere, find someone that you really connect with, maybe a different business to yours, but having the same sort of tensions, go and have a coffee together and interview each other. Or start yes. a podcast, you know, I mean. We'll start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the coffee is probably a little bit easier. I'm just yeah. going to <laughs> fact check that, fact check that. But, yes, I love the interviews so much easier because when you're just having a bit of a chit chat and if you're in an isolated area and you can't, you don't have any business friends around you, jump on a Zoom call and Absolutely. do that interview, right? Yeah, and for each other. Yep. And then you can even record that. You can cut it down and you can share it. Okay, so before we wrap things up, I just want to ask one sort of, I guess, tricky question or slightly tangent here, and that is if someone's about to put out a piece of content, should they be sense checking it and making sure that it fits within their pillars before they post or is it okay to go rogue? Look, that's such a bloody good question. There is a writing quote and I've gone completely blank on who it said, but it's it says about don't write from a bruise. For me, I'm all about writing from the bruise but not publishing from the bruise. So write it and then sit on it. So uh, absolutely um... sense check. And look, and that's, I mean, this is probably against everything you're telling people through your podcast. That's why I'm a bit of a fan of ye old story because it disappears fairly quickly you can put something out there if you need to if you want to and you can either pull it down really quickly or you can know it's gone and of course people can screenshot people can save these things people will get a sense of who you are for better or for worse but yeah write from the bruise but don't publish from the bruise yeah and when you say story holly you're referring to like instagram stories or facebook stories and we spoke about this last week with todd that can be a really good way to test a new topic or a new style of content out in this disappearing style of content, which I can't remember the name of it. I always forget the name of it. But ephemeral, I think is the, the correct yep. term for that. Yeah, disappearing style of content. But it can be a good way to test the waters and dip your toes in. Oh, it thank can. you. Thank What's you so that? much for joining us, Holly. This has been fantastic. Lots of really great practical takeaways. Got a few quick fire questions for you sure. before you go. First up, what's your favourite business tool? Oh, I'm so, call me grandma. It's a pencil and, or a pen and paper. I would expect nothing else. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What are you reading right now? Oh, that is a good one. I'm reading a book called The Girl in the Gold Bikini. It's like a modern day Nancy Drew set on the Gold Coast and it is hilarious. Oh, oh I'm going to have to go and download that yeah, on my Kindle. That's, that's so good. young adult fiction. Nice. All right, Clem, do you want to wrap things up for yes. our last question? What is your 2023 content marketing prediction? What do you think is going to happen? Oh, what a question. I Look, know. I know what I hope will happen and I think that'll be, I think we're going to drown in a little bit more vulnerability or faux vulnerability and that sort of content. But I think with the AI that's coming out, I'm seeing error after error and I'm screenshotting them because I'm that sort of a churlish witch. I think we're going to see some really, really good content that's going to arise from all the chaff. That's mm. that's what I'm thinking. Ooh. Out from the trash comes the diamond. Yeah. Well, the yeah. phoenix from the ashes. <laughs> oh, I love it. The visuals again. Because of course, you know, the visuals. You're such a great storyteller. Thank you, Holly. Now, if our audience want to connect with you, where's the best place to find you? Where do you hang out online? Instagram. That's where, I, you know, that's a bit more fun. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn. But again, let's go back to colonoscopies right there. It's not my platform, of choice, <laughs> but I am there. I am there. And, it, you know, it serves a purpose like all these platforms do. But yes, Instagram, slide into my DMs, which is as creepy as it sounds, but I love the <laughs> chat. Well, Excellent. thank you so much, Holly. Pleasure. Thank you. And we'll, we'll link to all of Holly's socials, her website, and of course her book, which is Tell Your Story. Thanks once again for joining us, Holly. Yeah. Great thank to have you, have you here. here. Thank you. Thanks.